Welcome to Bear Paw Media and Education's Public Legal Education webinar series. My name is Nadine Callahu Hansen. Bear Paw Media and Education is a Department of Native Counseling Services of Alberta, and our primary goals are to make public legal education understandable, accessible, and affordable for Indigenous people. We at Bear Paw are not lawyers, although we do endeavor to make sure that this information is correct and current to the best of our abilities and is edited by lawyers. Of course, laws change with elections and societal values. So this information is designed to be general in nature and may not apply to your specific situation. It may still be necessary to consult a lawyer for legal advice to assist you. For more information, you can go to our website at bearpawlegalresources.ca or follow us on social media at Bear Paw Legal. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land in which we gather is Treaty 6 territory and a traditional meeting ground and home for many Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, and Nakota Sioux. Today's topic is going to be Indigenous hunting, fishing, and trapping, and try to clarify some of the uh, mystery or gray area in that, in, in that area. So there have been lots of different uh, legal acts that have shaped Indigenous um, harvesting rights, inherent rights, in fact. And um, it seems as though as as the years go by and with every piece of legislation, um, our inherent rights continue to get chiseled away. Of course, the original um, piece of legislation that assured Indigenous um, rights was the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which, cre which was created by King George III. And then throughout, the, uh, throughout history, more and more legislation has been created, uh, treaties. The Royal Proclamation stated that um, anybody that wanted to utilize the land in the Americas for whatever purpose had to negotiate a treaty with the indigenous people. And so treaties were created and more legislations were um, passed to continue shaping and um, chiseling away at those inherent rights. Uh, one of the most significant uh, pieces of legislation was the Natural Resources Transfers Act of 1930, which eliminated indigenous rights to, uh, to commercially sell their hunting and fishing and trapping uh, products. Um, and then of course we continue on with the uh, Constitution Act of 1982, Section 35 of that Constitution, or the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which also um, clarified or um, endorsed Indigenous inherent rights uh, and recognized those. Uh, the Indian Act in 1985, uh, that was the, the most current uh, amendments the Métis Settlements Act of 1990, which uh, in Alberta gave Métis uh, people um, on settlements also harvesting rights. And then uh, most recently in 2019, we have the Métis Harvesting Agreement in Alberta as well. We'll talk more about those. So I had talked about the Natural Resources Transfers Act of 1930, which transferred ownership of resources from Canada to the province of Alberta. So there was a major shift in responsibility over who was going to manage those, uh, those resources. And so uh, the federal government, even though it is ultimately uh, their uh, jurisdiction, transferred manage management to the provinces. This act protects the inherent rights of Indigenous people to hunt, fish, and trap for food in Alberta. However, it did end commercial rights to hunt, fish, and trap. And one significant case that tried to 
um, fight that was Regina versus Horseman, and they did lose. There were some other um, significant cases as well. So uh, Horseman was 1990. Um, we had Regina versus Sundown and Regina versus Blaze, Badger and Gladstone. And again, they all lost. And then most recently, Regina versus Lamouche in 2000. And uh, Court of Queen's Bench in Alberta confirmed that the principles in the horsemen apply to fishing as well. And so um, they haven't been successful to uh, change the, the elimination of commercial rights to hunt fish and trap. And then, of course, we had mentioned briefly that Section 35 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, otherwise known as the Constitution Act, recognizes and affirms all Aboriginal and treaty rights. What that means is that Aboriginal and treaty rights can never be taken away. Okay. In Alberta, treaty Indians are guaranteed the right to hunt, fish, and trap for subsistence, that means for food, on all unoccupied crown lands, meaning not privately owned land. Uh, treaty in Indigenous people can do this at any time of the year. There are no limitations in terms of when, uh, just that they have to be on crown land, unoccupied, uh, not privately owned land. Treaty Indigenous people must carry their Indigenous, uh, their INAC cards or Indigenous Services Canada uh, card with them to prove their registered status. And should anybody from Sustainable Resources um, request to see that card, they must produce it upon request. So what does subsistence mean? It means supporting life. In other words, what you need to do in order to survive and or support you and your family. And some of the appeals have um, argued that um, if they sell what they hunt, fish or trap, so that they can uh, put fuel in their trucks, uh, purchase uh, things that they can't directly hunt, fish or trap, uh, so canned goods, those kinds of things, should also be classified as subsistence. To date, they've not been successful. So subsistence is what you directly do in order to survive to support you and your family. So what you hunt and fish and trap uh, to eat and not sell. All hunters, fishers, and trappers, including status Indigenous and Métis harvesters, can access private land if you get permission from the landowners. What our lawyer stated was clients could be advised that they do not need to ask permission of a landowner if the private land is unfenced, unsigned, has no clear buildings on it and is not being used for agricultural purposes. Or if the land is uncleared muskeg or uncultivated bushland. However, if the private land is clearly occupied, consent from the owner or occupier must be obtained before an indigenous person may hunt on that land. An Indigenous status person looking, for, looking to fish for food uh, needs to apply to Fish and Wildlife Sustainable Resources for an Indian domestic license. You only actually have to go to um, a, a Sustainable Resources office once to register. And once you're registered and you have um, a register, you're in their system, uh, every year, you just have to log on to the RELM uh, website in Alberta, and you can renew your Indian domestic license right online. You can print it off um, right from home. Uh, so you only actually have to go to their office anywhere in the province uh, once to register in their system. However, 
keep in mind that um, under the law, it is not an infringement. In the eyes of the law, it is not an infringement of an Indigenous person's harvesting rights to ask them to or to require that they uh, get a license. The license doesn't cost anything, it's free. Um, but you do, and, and there are no limits on that license. Um, it's just for management purposes only to know who is actually out there harvesting. Um, so you only have to go to the office once and then you, you are required to renew that license every year online. When indigenous people are fishing in national parks, they all individuals need to get a specific permit before doing so. You need to get one for every national park as well. When hunting migratory birds, status Indigenous people do not need a license, but they do need to abide by bag limits. And uh, again, um, it is not an infringement on harvesting rights um, when uh, sustainable resources puts uh, specific limits on um, certain uh, species. Uh, it's about managing, making sure that um, those resources are sustainable, that they continue. Um, and so uh, migratory birds, you don't need a license, but you do need to still abide by those bank limits. A status Indigenous person fishing for food needs to um, get a domestic license from Fish and Wildlife. This individual can use whatever means traditionally uh, for fishing, if it means using a rod, reel, net, etc. What the courts found is that getting a license is not an infringement on treaty rights, but placing conditions on that license may not be acceptable. So for example, having a certain size net, and this was bought or uh, appealed with Regina versus McCall in 1996. Uh, also uh, some other cases that, um, that were appealed, Regina versus Machatis in 1991, uh, where they were uh, fishing with gill nets without a license and uh, and then Regina versus Tommy in 2008, where there were restrictions on types of fishing gear. Um, and so in those cases, uh, what the courts had found was that um, if um, fish and wildlife uh, places conditions, um, it may or may not be an infringement on um, on Indigenous um, hunting and harvesting rights, as long as they can show or indicate that it's for the purpose of managing and maintaining, um, sustaining uh, those species. Registered Indigenous people, as well as March Métis harvesters, are not required to have a sport fishing license but they are required to follow sport fishing regulations. You can actually get on the RELM website, uh, you have instant access to all of the sport fishing and hunting regulations. All other individuals aged 16 to 64 need to buy a sport fishing license. And you can buy a license through private license issuers, or again, you can go on www.albertarelm.com Com. We did talk a little bit about the fishing in a national park. When fishing in a national park, all individuals over the age of 16 need to get a specific permit before doing so. You can get one permit, which is good for Banff, Jasper, Jasper Yoho, and Kootenai. For all other parks, you need a park-specific permit. These permits for Indigenous harvesters are free, but you do need to get them. If you choose not to get a permit, you may be breaking the law. Uh, phone Parks Canada for more information, and the number there is 
When hunting migratory birds, indigenous harvesters do not need a license, but they do need to abide by bag limits. So make sure that you access the, um, the hunting and fishing regulations on the albertarealm.com website so that you know exactly uh, what uh, limitations are out there. When we're talking about hunting, some general rules to follow, and they're very common sense. No one should hunt in a dangerous manner. No one should illegally discharge a weapon or firearm from a primary highway at night or within 200 yards of an occupied building. No one should discharge a weapon from a vehicle and no one should have a loaded firearm in a vehicle. Whether you are an indigenous harvester or just a regular run of the mill harvester, everybody has to abide by the firearm safety uh, regulations. There are two types of firearm licenses. There is non-restricted, uh, two types of non-restricted firearm licenses for the purpose of hunting. There's a minor's license for those under 18, as well as a possession of acquisition license, PAL, for everyone else. If you still have a firearms acquisition certificate or a, or a FAC, FAC, it is no longer valid and needs to be replaced with a PAL. All, all applications for firearms uh, will be made to the RCMP and the firearms officers. Most can be downloaded from the uh, RCMP website, or you can call 1-800-731-4000 and ask them to mail an application to you, no matter where you are in the province. PAL applications will ask you some very personal information, such as recent criminal charges, convictions, or discharges, any peace bonds or protection orders, uh, a history of suicide, depression, or substance abuse, reports against you to the police or social services, divorce, separation, job loss, or bankruptcy, and if you've had any changes in partners that you've lived with for over two years. A PAL is your authorization to possess a hunting firearm and to obtain ammunition. Because firearms are dangerous, the RCMP conducts a variety of background checks for all applications. The PAL application has several personal history questions that you need to be prepared to answer. If you answer yes to any of these questions, you will be asked to provide more information. A yes answer does not necessarily mean that your PAL application will be denied. However, if the RCMP is considering denying your application, this is where some legislation in the Firearms Act specifically for Indigenous people may come into play for you. In 1996, the Firearms Act was changed to include several adaptations for Indigenous people who engage in the traditional hunting practices of their community. The key benefits are getting alternatively certified for firearm safety training instead of having to pass a Canadian firearm safety course. The ability for children under 12 to legally engage in the traditional hunting practices of their community. And if you think some of your answers to your personal history questions may lead to your PAL application being denied, you can submit an elder or leader's recommendation stating that it is important for you to participate in the traditional hunting practices of your community. The RCMP and Chief Firearms Officer will then consider that recommendation when making their final, their final decision on issuing you a firearms license. As part of the Aboriginal Indigenous adaptations to the Firearms Act, a qualified Indigenous people 
uh, qualified Indigenous people have the ability to not have to take the firearm safety course and instead apply to be alternatively certified. Using Form 5642 on the RCMP website, Indigenous People of Canada Adaptations Regulations, an elder may be grantor, uh, alter may, uh, alternative certification based on their status as an elder and by signing a declaration that states that they engage in the traditional hunting practices of my Aboriginal community. If you are an, an adult over 18, but not an elder, you can only be eligible for alternative certification if the Canadian Firearm Safety Course is not available within reasonable time, location, or cost. So if, um, if the course isn't, um, isn't readily available in a timely fashion, if it's not um, uh, available anywhere in your, uh, in your area, or if the cost is prohibitive, you just can't afford to take the, the course, uh, then you may qualify to be alternatively certified. In the application, you would require an elder or leader in your community to fill out a recommendation that explains why they believe it's important for you to participate in the traditional hunting practices of your community. The elder or leader would then have to check one box that declares that they believe you know the safe handling, transportation, storage, and use of firearms and the laws relating to them. The second box simply declares that to the best of their knowledge, you are a member of an Indigenous community and engage in traditional hunting practices. Miners can hunt and transport firearms and ammunition unsupervised with a miner's license. If they don't have the miner's license, in both cases, they have to be using a registered non-restricted firearm. Without the license, minors need to be supervised by an adult with a PAL and are not allowed to transport firearms and ammunition. With or without the license, minors are not able to purchase or acquire firearms. A minor's license application cannot be obtained online you must contact the chief firearms officer of the province or territory where, where you live in and request the form directly. Parental consent may be required and you will also be required to have either taken the Canadian Firearm Safety Course or have received an alternative certificate. The process for a minor applying for alternative certification is mostly the same as an adult application. However, if you don't have an elder or a leader who can make the recommendation for you, you can use another adult in your community who has known you at least six months and either already passed the firearm safety course or has been alternatively certified. Even minors under 12 with the consent and likely an interview with their parents or guardians are eligible to apply for a minor's license. They would need a written recommendation from an elder or leader in their community who would indicate that the minor under 12 knows about the safe handling of firearms and their laws. Once a minor turns 18, their minor's license is no longer valid and they also will have to apply for a PAL. Once you complete your firearms application, mail it to the RCMP. You can expect at least 45 days to process your application. Licenses are valid for five years. Make sure to renew your license before the expiry date and you won't have any delay in your hunting season. According to the Alberta Wildlife Act, no one should let the edible meat of any animal or bird be wasted. You must remove all edible meat from a harvested animal or bird and use for food. Failing to do this 
could result in a criminal charge. The Alberta Wildlife Act does not refer specifically to hunting for medicinal purposes. According to the Alberta Wildlife Act, a person can kill a fur-bearing animal, mountain lion or bear, and leave the carcass as long as the skin is not wasted. And this was uh, a case, Regina versus Lenny, in 2006, where hunters shot a black bear, skinned it, and left the carcass. And the court said that it was legal. However, um, Jack Woodward, the lawyer that we consulted with this, advised that some species that are dwindling, such as the grizzly bear, are a hot topic and leaving the carcass may be received poorly. Woodward strongly recommends against leaving the carcass of an at-risk species. All hunters, including treaty indigenous, must register certain species of wildlife, such as the grizzly bear, the male bighorn sheep over one year of age, cougar, mountain goat, and bison. What the courts found was that the requirement to register your kill is not an infringement on treaty rights, such as the case in Regina versus Rogers in 1998, uh, which, which was a case from Treaty 7, where um, an Indigenous person failed to report an elk kill. The court said that the need to report kill is to assist in conservation and management. Therefore, there is no infringement on treaty rights. And again, if you are registered, uh, you can access the Alberta Realm, R-E-L-M website. And another piece, another really handy dandy piece of information on that website is a complete list of at-risk species. And so uh, if you are out hunting and you're not quite certain about uh, a species that is in your line of sight, you can always check to see if it is uh, an at-risk species. And the only requirement that Indigenous people have when hunting um, at-risk species is that they must register it with um, Indigenous or with uh, sustainable resources. Certain types of game cannot be sent outside of Alberta. And in fact, I would always say to uh, err on the side of caution when uh, Indigenous people are uh, bringing, um, bringing uh, game in or out of Alberta. Um, so simply contact your local Fish and Wildlife Office um, if you want to take um, game in or out of Alberta, you may be required to have a transport license. Um, and again, these licenses are free for Indigenous people or Métis harvesters. Um, but you do, you for many species, you are required to have at least a transport license so that they know um, where you're taking that, uh, that game. And also failing to get that uh, transport license can result in having your game confiscated and be criminally charged. When Indigenous or Métis people are trapping fur-bearing animals, the uh, Indigenous people, treaty people, must have an Indian fur management license, uh, which they can get either from a uh, sustainable resources office, or they can even go to their band administration office uh, to get one of these licenses. And there is, again, no charge for that license. The only requirement is that you must be at least 14 years of age and you must have, uh, you must be in possession of this license when you are uh, trapping uh, for bearing animals. This also applies for Métis uh, people, Métis harvesters. And again, you can get the, um, the license from a sustainable resources office, or you can go to your settlement office uh, in Alberta um, and you can get that license free of charge. 
the courts have found that the um, the National Resources Transfers Act of 1930 did in fact extinguish, get rid of all commercial commercial rights to hunt, fish, or trap. Um, and should anybody, including Indigenous people, want to hunt, fish, or trap uh, commercially, they would have to get commercial licenses just like anybody else. 2019 was a huge year for Métis people. And so um, there was in Alberta, the Métis Harvesting Agreement was signed between uh, the president of the uh, Métis Nations of Alberta, Audrey Poitras, um, and the uh, province of Alberta. And so what this agreement states is that all Métis members of the Métis Nations of Alberta uh, now will have uh, the right to hunt, fish, and trap within regional boundaries established by the Métis Nations of Alberta. They have four areas in Alberta, A, B, C, and D. Now this harvesting agreement does not apply to uh, members of Métis settlements and um, because they have um, they have the Métis Settlements Act of 19 from 1990 and uh, so they are still bound by that act which states that they can hunt fish and trap within a 160 kilometer radius of their settlement. Uh, for those Métis people that are not members of a uh, settlement, but are a member of the Métis Nations of Alberta, you can apply for your harvesting uh, license through the MNA and, um, and they will actually um, either grant or deny your application if you, uh, if you are successful. Uh, they will issue you a Métis harvesting card that will show what regional boundaries you can harvest in A, B, C, and D. I'd like to also mention that at this time, there is still no Métis harvesting recognized in Southern Alberta. Um, although I have been advised by somebody from uh, uh, the uh, sustainable resources office that that is in the works that they are looking at or developing something because obviously Métis people didn't just um, you know come to Alberta and come as far as Edmonton and then stop that we do have uh, Métis people that uh, have traditionally uh, resided in the southern part of the province that have been fighting to be recognized. And so, um, as I'd mentioned, uh, laws change all the time with societal values and uh, with every election. And so um, this, this may change in the not far off future as well. And once it does change, We'll be sure to let you know. Métis harvesters do not need a license, only their MNA harvesting card. Just like Indigenous treaty people, there are no seasonal boundaries, but the MNA encourages not to harvest from January to July, especially of female species. And again, it's really about uh, sustainable, making sure those resources are still available for future generations. As well, can only harvest for subsistence for family only. You can have a non-Indigenous person assist with the harvest as long as they are not the shooter. My contact person at the MNA and who you would contact as well if you have any questions uh, regarding Métis harvesting uh, would be Craig Latonder. And he provides meat for elders 
in his community. However, he says that it's a personal choice that you may need to defend in court. And so it's, it has to be a personal choice. The MNA have uh, listed some harvesting conservation practices that I've included in here. Métis people have been harvesting plants and animals as a means of survival for hundreds of years and are rooted in traditional belief systems and ways of life. Métis harvesters maintain a fine balance between meeting the needs of their people and protecting wildlife and their habitats. As part of implementing the new Métis harvesting in Alberta policy, we wanna share important practices for your consideration before your next harvest. Harvest what is available and take only what you need. Métis harvesting is, by its very nature, conservation focused. These traditional practices include no big game hunting from January to July, as well as no harvesting of female game if accompanied by offspring less than one year old. Know your species and their appropriate ages for harvesting, as well as breeding season management practices. Harvest where the environment is healthy and populations are plentiful. Be aware of current rules and regulations surrounding gun safety. And just like with treaty indigenous people, you do need to register as a harvester uh, with the sustainable resources uh, first time only, you do need to actually go to the office of a sustainable resources uh, in your area and register in person. Once you're registered and in their system, you can actually go on their website every year and renew your licenses. And all licenses are free for Indigenous harvesters, whether you're Métis or Treaty. With Métis fishing, you need to get a domestic license again, once, from Sustainable Resources who will issue a win card, again, free of charge if you don't already have one, and will then list you as an Indigenous harvester. Once you're listed, you will be able to print off the Métis harvesting regulations from their website and no fishing from April 1st to May 14th annually. Métis individuals can no longer present a Métis Nations of Alberta card as proof of their Métis identity. Métis indi individuals need to meet the Pauli test. However, with the new Métis harvesting agreement um, that um, presenting a Métis harvesting card should be enough, however, um, Sustainable resources officers do have the right to ask um, Indigenous harvesters to provide some type of proof that um, they have a uh, connection to that region and that they're an accepted member of the community. Pauli was an important case in Ontario that eventually went before the Supreme Court of Canada in 1998. The Supreme Court of Canada said that Métis do have a right to hunt for food under Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution. The Pauli test, um, you may be asked to provide proof that you belong to a contemporary Métis community in Alberta, which community and demonstrate acceptance by an involvement in the community, and that you reside in Alberta. For any questions that you might have around uh, Métis harvesting, you can contact Craig Latonder uh, at the uh, MNA in Edmonton. His phone number is 780-455-2200 uh, and his email address clatonder at metis.org. To meet the Pauli test, one must provide evidence to support the following, that you self-identify as Métis and for how long. You have an ancestral connection to a historic Métis community in Alberta. 
you belong to a contemporary Métis community in Alberta, which community and demonstrate acceptance by and involvement in the community and that you reside in Alberta. To exercise your right as an, a Métis harvester, Métis individuals need to prove their Métis identity by meeting the Pauli test. m and &E membership or Métis settlement memberships are an example as well as genealogical history, where your ancestors lived and when. We also have uh, eight recognizable um, Métis settlements in Alberta that um, have the Métis Settlements Act of 1990 that oversees um, their, what they can and can't do. So if you meet the Pauli test, you will be given a letter confirming your ability to hunt, fish and trap within 160 kilometers of the eight Métis settlements. And they're all north of, El uh, north of Edmonton, uh, Paddle Prairie, Peavine, East Prairie and Gift Lake, which are in the northwest part of the province. And then we have Elizabeth, Kikano, Buffalo Lake and Fishing Lake, which are in the northeast part of Alberta. But we also have 17 historic and contemporary Métis communities in Alberta as well. Uh, areas around Bonneville, Cadott Lake, Conklin, Cold Lake, Fort Chipewyan, uh, Fort Mackay, Fort Vermilion, Gruard, Lac La Biche, Lac St. Anne, Peace River, Slave Lake, Smoky Lake, St. Paul, Trout Lake, Wabasca, and Wolf Lake. Métis harvesters should bring this letter with them when hunting, fishing, and trapping. If you do not meet the Pauli test or are a non-status individual, you may choose to buy a license to hunt, fish or trap and follow all rules and regulations. If you choose not to buy a license, you may be fined and or charged. We have, we always have cases uh, in before the courts. Regina versus Jones Bates and Herscorn uh, were the three cases in Medicine Hat Provincial Court that were uh, three Métis harvesters charged with hunting without a license. And their appeal was, or their argument was that there are Métis people that are traditionally south of Edmonton and that they should be recognized. And like I said, um, this may come, uh, this may, um, we may see changes fairly uh, in the in the fairly near future regarding this. So, what happens if you are actually charged and choose to plead not guilty or refuse to pay a fine? The process for pleading not guilty to a charge concerned with hunting, fishing, or trapping is similar to that of any other offense before the courts. If a person is charged with a hunting, fishing, or trapping offense, information on the violation ticket will indicate whether a court appearance is required along with the location, date, and time of the court, or if a fine must be paid. Most cases will be heard in the provincial court for traffic. However, if a firearm is involved, the case may be sent to criminal court. A plea will be entered at the first court appearance after the charge is read. Uh, sometimes it's possible to ask to reserve the plea to allow more time to understand the charge, collect additional information, or talk to a lawyer. Legal assistance can be obtained through various means, including the lawyer referral services, legal aid, and other services available in the province. Once a plea of not guilty is entered, the judge will set a date for, for a trial. The defendant can ask for disclosure, which is all the evidence the Crown has for the case. At the trial, both sides will have an opportunity to, um, to provide evidence, cross-examine witnesses and make legal arguments. At the end of the trial, the judge will decide whether to uh, find for the defendant as guilty or not guilty. If the defendant is found not guilty, he or she is free to go. Uh, a guilty verdict will result in a sentence that, it, that could include a fine, 
probation, jail, or a combination of those. And so now what I would like to do is end the session with a video. Teaching young people about the importance of exercising their traditional right to hunt isn't about going out and shooting an animal. It's really about teaching them their responsibility to the land and to their family. It touches on the uh, essence of why our young people are so lost, especially the young men. They don't have a clue as to what their role is anymore. And so they turn to drugs or alcohol. They live a very abusive lifestyle. Today, we're going to talk about the role of hunters, traditional law, and our rights and responsibilities as Aboriginal people. As well, we're going to look at Canadian law and the licensing of firearms for the purposes of hunting. To me, hunting and doing those things will help them get self-esteem and to be a provider, you know, to feed their young family, gives them something that they can look forward to, that they feel good about. The late Harold Cardinal used the Cree term, Awanakiano. That's who are we? Hunting through our traditional rights is part of our identity. It's part of knowing who we are and how we fit into the larger picture. Firearms licensing is like a driver's license. It's a requirement. There are two types of non-restricted firearms licenses for the purposes of hunting. A minor's license for those under 18, and for everyone over 18, a possession and acquisition license, also known as a PAL. I am a firearms officer for the RCMP's Canadian Firearms Program. It's really important to have a firearms license because that is what lets you be in legal possession of a firearm. All Aboriginal people, whether you are First Nation, Métis, or Inuit, require a PAL to legally possess and acquire firearms and ammunition for hunting. Quick note here, if you still have a Firearms Acquisition Certificate, or FAC, it is no longer valid and needs to be replaced with a PAL. Gun laws and gun legislation is really important because it's about safety. The treaty stated that we will inherit and continue to enjoy the former life of what our people had lived. Having to acquire a license, if that's what it's gonna take, then I can go along with that. But let's co-manage it so that our teachings and our ways of managing our gifts, our the animals, are integrated with those laws. So it benefits both parties. And that was the intention of the treaty in the first place. No matter what type of firearms license you apply for, you will be applying to the RCMP and the Chief Firearms Officer. Most applications are available for download on the RCMP website. If you don't have access to the internet or aren't comfortable with computers, you can call 1-800-731-4000 and ask them to mail you an application. So, aunties, you've been hunting for a really long time. Do you have your pal with you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. Can I see it? I like to keep mine on you. Also mine. Treaty card, eh? Oh, because yeah. when you're out there, you have to have it. Wow. So. If you don't have that, there's no way you can buy ammo. Well, if you're going hunting, eh, and you're transporting a gun or firearm, whatever, if you get stopped and you don't have your pal and you have a gun, your treaty card ain't gonna save you. Mm-hmm. Those laws have to be understood. Our traditional laws versus laws created by man, those are 
two different sets of laws, and we have to pay attention to both. The Aboriginal right to hunt doesn't come from a government or an agency. That's the gift that was given to us by the Creator. It's not a right to be abused, and there are very strict laws around that right, and those are our natural laws. Those are the laws of the land that are taught to us. Creator give us these animals to help us survive and to live. We have a relationship with them and we have to know that. And if we abuse that, then we're gonna pay the price. Some of the uh, disturbing, I guess, things that I witnessed also with, from some of our uh, relatives on the reserve was that, you know, they would have a drink and then go hunting. Some guys take, uh, you know, six or seven moose in uh, one day, and they have such a small family. Even if they were to give that away, it's still too much. There's a certain time in the season, too, that we hunt. When the animals are pregnant, we don't bother them. Because firearms are dangerous, the RCMP conducts a variety of background checks for all applications. The PAL application has several personal history questions that you need to be prepared to answer. We're looking to see what the risk would be for a certain individual to own and possess firearms in their house. It will take into account someone's background, criminal history or criminal past, their medical history. Doing an investigation, interviews, to try to gauge what their suitability is to have a firearms license and be a responsible firearms owner. If someone has a criminal or child welfare history and are afraid that they won't get approved for a gun license, we have to recognize that there is historical and intergenerational trauma that has affected the criminal records and the behavior of many of our Indigenous people in Canada. That is a, a responsibility of the Government of Canada to acknowledge that. Yes, we have the adaptation regulations. So it's called APCAR, the Aboriginal Peoples of Canada Adaptations Regulations. Answering yes to any of those questions does not automatically preclude you from getting a firearms license. There's an area in the APCAR application that allows for their elder or leader of their Aboriginal community to write a recommendation saying, you know, why it's important for them to have a firearms license and that they do participate in traditional hunting. If it comes across my desk, sometimes I'm able to place conditions on licenses and other times I'm able to grant a full firearms license. So growing up, hunting was a huge responsibility that was placed on all the family members. It wasn't the dad or the older brother or the uncle. It was a shared responsibility, even with the women and the young girls. If you want to eat, you got to go get it. Growing up as kids, that's all we ever did, right? Go home from camp to camp. Come home from school, oh, what shall we do? We may have to go scrape the hide. <laughs> nothing ever went to waste when we were growing up. We, nothing still really goes nothing. to waste. We don't waste anything. Yeah. But See, you get this little strip, then you hang it and it smokes and that's your stew. We still have to follow those very strict, you know, protocols and very strict teachings around hunting and respecting that animal. They're better than the animal gives its life to us, to feed us, to sustain us. And we're fortunate when we're able to provide food for our family, because that's a gift. Most of us grew up that it's a communal thing, so you share with the larger community. The organs and some of the meat is set aside for certain ceremonies. My boys have always been taught that they're not just hunting for them and their family, but they're hunting for the elders. That gift out there that has its own laws and its own world, everything that they forage, they eat, is something that we eat, it benefits us because they've eaten that and it's part of their medicine. So when we take it, it's part of our medicine now, it's given that to us. My girls know how to do this. They also help me with drying my hides. This is the best part of our traditional lives. 
So when fall comes and we're all out there hunting, you come home, you have everybody coming over and asking for dry meat. When I was growing up, there was not a lot of technical teaching of, of a rifle or how to handle a gun. It was really some very basic things. Never trust an empty gun, never point a gun. We were taught how to carry a rifle properly because it's a tool. That tool is what helped to feed your family. Okay, Auntie, what are some basic rules you would teach me about handling a gun? I think one of the first things you have to always make sure like it's not loaded. And you have to always be aware like there's nobody, like you're not point, pointing this. Like, I, I see that a lot. Like when people are hunting, they'll pick up their gun and then they're loading it in the quad and then... Mm -hmm. The Canadian Firearm Safety Course is controlled by the RCMP and is mandatory for most Canadians in order to apply for a PAL because the Canadian Firearm Safety Course has so much great knowledge in it that it's really beneficial to people of all levels of experience with firearms. If you're hunting, how do you cross a fence or you know, get out of a boat safely with your hunting rifles? How would you tell which ammunition you need for your firearms? Things like that that are really useful in everyday life when you're using your firearms for traditional hunting. There are times when, because of location, the safety course isn't available or it's too cost prohibitive for people to take. Qualified Aboriginal people have the ability to not have to take the firearm safety course and instead apply to be alternatively certified. In these situations, I'll call the person and we'll talk about firearm safety and I'll put them through a brief test over the phone that kind of covers off the basics of firearm safety and handling. For a recommendation, what I'm looking for is that an elder of the community or a leader in the community recommends that person to have a firearms license and says that they have that basic foundation of firearms knowledge. <laughs> Youth under 18 can borrow a non-restricted firearm legally for hunting or target shooting without a license. There just has to be an adult with a valid PAL within reach of the minor and able to interject if necessary. Minors can have more freedom if they receive a minor's license. You gotta watch where you're holding it. You don't go filling it all over the place. You hold one place up here. A minor's license lets a minor under 18 be in possession of non-restricted firearms for certain purposes. And those purposes are hunting, target shooting, or shooting competitions. And it also allows the minor to purchase ammunition as long as there aren't any territorial or provincial laws regulating that. It does not allow a minor to own or acquire any firearms. Generally speaking, you have to be a minimum of 12 years old to apply for a minor's license. However, under the adaptation regulations, they allow for an Aboriginal youth under 12 to apply for and get a minor's license if they're engaging in traditional hunting in their community. Once a minor turns 18, their minor's license is no longer valid and they will have to apply for a PAL. You can expect at least 45 days to process your application. If you currently have a PAL, make sure to renew it on time and you won't have any delay in your hunting season. We try to abide and respect the laws that the government's putting in place. We need to create that respectful relationship, not only for ourselves, but also the animals out there. You know, we often hear, oh, you treaty people. Well, we're not standing alone having a treaty. There's another group over, and that's you. We had an agreement. Live up to your agreement, and we'll live up to ours. We'll coexist, and we'll work together to protect our rights, to protect our land, to protect the animals, you know, to protect the interests of our next generations to come, our children, grandchildren. Those are important things to us as elders, and that's why we need to do this. 
they're not two separate laws in that they don't walk individually. The laws of Canada and natural laws walk together. And it's a matter of working through those relationships between the two laws. All right, so before we finish off this, um, this webinar, uh, one thing I would also like to mention is with uh, Treaty Indigenous people, um, that uh, they, are, they do have to abide by the boundaries set by their treaty. So if you are a member of Treaty 7 or Treaty 6, then your harvesting boundaries typically are within your treaty boundaries. However, that being said, um, if you were to uh, want to harvest in another treaty area, uh, what you would need to do is get a letter from the, uh, from the First Nation uh, band that in the area where you would like to harvest, it's called a shipman letter, S-H-I-P-M-A-N, shipman letter. Um, and as long as you have that letter, you can harvest in other treaty areas. All right, so uh, that concludes the webinar, Bear Paw um, Media and Education webinar on Indigenous harvesting, hunting, fishing, and trapping. I hope you enjoyed uh, the information. I hope it brought some clarity on to a very gray area of topic. Um, and um, hopefully you will access some of our other resources, www.bearpawlegalresources.ca. Have a wonderful day.